on energy efficiency. We had one last year that many of you went to, which was in uh, Corwin. This year will be downtown at the uh, uh, Billcorn. And uh, uh, we've got a lot of good speakers. It's a day and a half, uh, May 12th and 13th. And uh, from Dan Riker at Google to Michael Peavy, who's president of the California Public Utilities Commission. So it's a, it's a very packed schedule. And, and uh, any IE or, or UCSB faculty or students talk to Whitney in terms of registering. Uh, but we'd love to see you all there. So without further ado, uh, Fred and Chong will introduce uh, our speaker. We're very happy to have uh, Larry Smar here today. Um, Larry was the founding director of uh, Cal IT2 at, uh, at UC San Diego, uh, which was started in 2000. Before that, um, he was uh, the founding director of NCSA um, at Illinois um, for 15 years. Uh, was there. And um, he served on, on quite a number of uh, advisory boards, um, President Clinton's PTAC board, for which we have Paul have to thank you, uh, for many years of information technology research uh, for NSF, um, as well as uh, advisory boards for NIH and NASA. Um, he's a member of the NAE, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and uh, uh, of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, and in 2006, he received the IEEE Computer Society uh, to tell me to deny award for lifetime achievements in distributed computing. Um, uh, when I sort of looked around uh, when we were looking for the speakers in this uh, energy leadership series, um, I was looking for uh, someone who sort of looked at how IT uh, could you know, have positive uh, effects on uh, environmental um, uh, issues. And I, and I saw that uh, Larry basically had sort of the most comprehensive um, keynotes and talks in this area, and I'm very happy to have you here today. Thanks very much, Fred. Um, let's get uh, up to my talk here. So uh, I've had a mixed background. I'm currently in the computer science and engineering department at UC San Diego, um, founding director of this multidisciplinary institute, uh, Cal IT2, that looks at how exponential change in information technology, telecommunication, nanotechnology, and biotechnology will impact energy, the environment, health, and our culture, but I started out as a physicist doing computational science and general relativity, and in particular, I worked a lot with the uh, climate change community decades ago when it was just as clear then as it is now that the overproduction of CO2 by our species is causing fundamental changes in the planet that we live on. So I've come back to that area in the last few years and spent a lot of time reading hundreds of scientific papers, meeting with a lot of our leaders in this area, and trying to put it together with what does information technology have to do with climate change, either in terms of causing it or in terms of helping ameliorate the problem that's coming up. And fortunately, the industry is way out ahead on this one compared to the governments of the world. And this uh, report, which was produced by the, what we call the ICT industry, the Information Communication Technology Industry, uh, SMART 2020, uh, is a fabulous document. And I recommend everyone to read it. Um, it it's a, one of the few things that gives us hope at a time of uh, mounting despair as you look, as I'll show you, uh, just how bad things are going to get, um, how soon, much sooner than we think. But uh, what fundamentally, you know, the problem isn't so difficult to understand. We currently have a high carbon economy. 
and we've got to get to a low carbon economy. And we're in the transition between the two at the moment. And we're going to overshoot with too much carbon production before we get to the low carbon. And that's the difficulty. So the question is, how can we limit the amount of overshoot? And that's what this report really looks at. And so I'll be coming back to it. Now, the president's science advisor and the head of the Office of Science uh, Technology Policy, John Holdren, uh, has uh, a lot of good videos on the web. I recommend them. But this is a quote from one of them. Um, I would agree with him that the term global warming has been an unfortunate choice to de describe what's going on. Not that the globe is not on average warming, but nobody lives at an average temperature on Earth. right? And so the fluctuations that go on um, make that uh, hard to understand. It implies it's gradual when, in fact, it's rapid, it's uniform when, in fact, it's non-uniform. It's mainly about temperature when, in fact, it affects everything, everywhere uh, about climate. And that, it, you know, particularly if you live in, like, Finland, maybe some global warming would be good for you, right? Uh, so it might be benign. But, in fact, almost everything is going to be disruptive and harmful. Uh, and as he says, this ongoing disruption is real without a doubt, mainly caused by humans, although uh, it is true that uh, the calculations include the solar variations in intensity, the uh, El Nino-La Nina cycle, the volcanic activity, and so forth. Uh, all of that has to be included. And as I'll show you with just one example, it's growing much more rapidly than expected. Now, what I find is that because we have a very uh, political debate about what is largely a scientific topic, uh, the science tends to get lost. And so what I'll show you is just some facts. And I'll be happy to give you these uh, slides. I've put uh, URLs uh, or sources on every one of them so you can go look them up. Uh, but this is to indicate how much the uh, rise in CO2 is, how fast it is compared with the last 1,000 years. Uh, but also, you'll notice uh, 1769, sort of the start of the Industrial Revolution, is when this happened. And all during this medieval warm period, Little Ice Age, in which huge variations in climate took place on Earth, that was in a very narrow range of, of carbon dioxide. Now, by the way, I'm just talking about carbon dioxide. It's only about half of the greenhouse gases. So we're not talking about methane and nitrous oxides and chlorofluorocarbons and all of that. Uh, they're, they're an interesting thing as well, but um, we only got a finite time. And, and I just want to really give you this as a sort of an indicator of why the urgency is as great as it is. So this is, again, a fairly non-controversial uh, source, the, uh, the uh, United Kingdom Meteorological Office. And this is just the average global temperature per decade. Uh, since the 1850s. And what you can see is a dramatic increase. Uh, and it is true that the temperature, global temperature, varied uh, very little during the last decade because the sun was actually going through a down phase of its 11-year cycle. And uh, it's the sum of, of what the sun is doing to the Earth plus what we're doing. And so now the sun is starting back up. And so I'm afraid that this next decade may be uh, quite a surprise for people as to how hot it gets. Um, now the other thing is that the Earth system is enormously complex and it's full of multiple time scales and lags and so forth. And so even though there's a CO2, that doesn't mean that the full temperature that comes from the greenhouse warming has, been, uh, has occurred yet. And this is one of the best papers I know on sort of a summary of this. When they say that there's uncertainty about the amount of warming that's going to occur because of the clouds and because of the aerosols and all this, that is correct. There is scientific uncertainty. We represent uncertainty in science with a dotified bell curve. And so what you can see here is with the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases that are in the air, plus the aerosols and so forth, what is the expected equilibrium temperature? Say we didn't add any more, right? And the answer, you can see, it's uncertain. But whether you look at the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this is their 90% range, or you do a more accurate uh, statistical, you're seeing it's about 2.5 degrees. 
and yet we've only seen uh, 0.8, so say a third of that warming so far. And the reason is that, the, as you know, the last time you boiled water for your coffee uh, or your tea, it took a while. And that's because there's a thermal inertia in water. It, it's hard to warm up the er, uh, water. And if we'll remember, we're a water planet. Three quarters of the surface of this Earth is water. And it takes uh, 50 years or so for the thermal inertia of the oceans to catch up and, and so that's part of why uh, we're only partially warmed up from the amount we've already put in as far as a forcing function in terms of the CO2. But the other is because of the rapid industrialization of China and India, the very source of a lot of the uh, extra CO2 that's coming into the air, the aerosols, the air pollution, if you've ever been to China, uh, which is horrendous, is actually a cooling agent. Just like when a volcano goes off, the, the sulfur-rich uh, uh, dust particles cool the earth. And, and so um, uh, that actually is about cooling almost 50% of the warming effect. Now the problem is, as the people of the world, like in China, rebel against having to have this kind of environmental mess to live in, as the United States did, for instance, at the turn of the last century, around 1900, 1800, 18, late 1880s, there, uh, our cities were just like China. Um, as they clean that up, that cooling blanket will be removed and, the, and you'll get a much rapid, more rapid increase in warming than you'd expect just from a linear response to the CO2. Well, is this a reasonable picture or not? Good question. So the way we do science is we say, well, say this is a hypothesis, okay? If, it, if this is the case, what might we expect to be seeing going on on Earth since we're still coming up this direction. And so these are what we call tipping points. The Arctic summer ice disappearing, the Himalayan glaciers melting, the Greenland ice sheet beginning to melt, the Amazon rainforest uh, drying out and burning up. Um, and, and these happen progressively as you go forward uh, in temperature, if you go to higher temperatures. So, you know, let's just check out this hypothesis. Let's look at the lowest hanging fruit, the Arctic, uh, summer ice and uh, see what the situation is. Well, if you go back to the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, the last one in 2007, the uncertainty in the blue lines are what the codes, the supercomputer codes uh, across a dozen at least uh, global, independent global climate codes showed <coughs> for the Arctic sea ice extent, this being zero, and this is in, in millions of kilometers, um, and it showed a slow decrease in the uh, summer ice. The winter ice, it's still cold enough that it'll refreeze, but the summer is when um, it, it might uh, happen. So you're seeing the end of the century, it's still got lots of ice in, in, in the summer. And yet the satellite measurements looking down on the North Pole ice cap shows that the extent of ice has been rapidly decreasing, much more so than the models would have predicted. Well, this is pretty interesting that it's melting at all because if you look back, and this is a recent uh, paper from last September in the journal Science, uh, they've reconstructed for the last 2,000 years the temperature uh, in the northern regions of, of the Earth, and you can see that it's been cooling almost all of that time. And it's only in the last few decades, as they say up here, that this unexpected warming trend, unexpected from the way the data was going, uh, has happened. And in fact, uh, the, this is uh, 200 decades, right? 2,000 years, 200 decades. And in the last, last decade, okay, we see uh, the warmest of, of those 200, a statistically improbable event. So it would seem as if the Arctic region is in fact warming. And if we look at the satellite images, this is from NASA, then you can see that back in from 1980 to 2000, the second year ice, which is the, the dark colored stuff, uh, compared to 2009, has almost disappeared. And here you can see it quantitatively. This is the percent of the ice cover that is second year, first year, and this is the, the, the thinnest the stuff that just comes and goes each year. And, and this is zero, right? So you can see that 
uh, from looking on top, it looks as if uh, things are, are bad. And for people who live up there and who, who spent their life working in the Arctic on ice, they've never seen anything like the rapidity at which the ice is melting. But this is what really uh, was amazing to me. I, I've worked with the uh, scientist at the uh, Naval Postgraduate School of Monterey. Uh, the Navy, you know, has been putting nuclear submarines under the ice uh, <laughs> since the 50s. And so they worry not about the surface, they worry about the volume of the ice because they worry about the thickness because the whole point was you had to bust up through the ice to be able to launch your missiles uh, at Russia. So you needed to know how thick the ice was. And so this is now not the surface, as you see from satellites, but the actual volume of the ice. And we see it was stable and even growing, right? And this is going back to 1980. And then something very unexpected started, and, and that is a very rapid melting of the volume, the ice cube itself. This is floating ice, right? So this is not going to raise sea level at all. It's, it's just like an ice cube when it melts in your drink, the level of the water is just the same unlike Antarctica and Greenland, um, which is a, as they gradually melt. But look at where the, uh, and you know, this was a talk at the AAAS meeting in, um, in this February in San Diego. Zero is 2015, this being 2010. So rather than 2100 when there's still ice, according to the last IPCC report from the models, it looks like maybe in four to five years. And so this is what we mean about the, uh, when people say the IPC is overstating how bad it's going to get soon, here's just one example where apparently nature uh, is acting on a faster time scale than you might think. Why? I mean, we've had ice melt before, right? I mean, when you go from the depths of an ice age to an interglacial period like now, you melt a lot of ice. The sea goes up by hundreds of feet. Okay, from all that melting ice. And in particular, here's the last time. This is from, uh, time goes this way on this graph from this particular article. Uh, this is 22,000 years ago. This is the CO2, this is the temperature, and this is the depth of the ice age. The ice was in the present location of Chicago higher than the Sears Tower. Okay. And then this warming started, and then here, about 10,000, 11,000 years ago, uh, the climate stabilized until today, and that's why civilization started, the river valley started, agriculture started, and everything else. Well, let's see how fast that CO2 went up. So CO2 is measured from the ice cores, actually you get the little bubbles and measure the amount of CO2 in them. And what you can see here is that, let's just go say from 17,000 years ago to say 11,000 years ago, that's 6,000 years, and in that 6,000 years, this is the CO2 level in parts per million, went from 185 to 265, divide the two, and you get about a little over one and a third parts per million in CO2 going up every century. Well, here's the famous Mauna Loa record. I went to Mauna Loa on a scientific pilgrimage in December to actually climb up, you know, drive up the mountain up the volcano to where these heroic scientists have been taking these individual measurements since the 1950s. And um, you can see here in parts per million that we've gone from about uh, 315 up to today, almost 390. And if you just look at so like the last couple of decades, 30 years or so, we're going up 1.6 parts per million, not per century, but per year. So what we're doing is the CO2 is going up 100 times faster than the quote unquote natural time scale at which the Earth adapts uh, in the cooling of the ice, in the, in the melting of the ice. Now, here's the last 800,000 years of those ice ages coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, 800,000 years ago. And you'll notice that this is all happening in a very narrow band of CO2 from you know, maybe 180 parts per million up to less than 300. And all of those coming and goings, vast climate changes <clears throat> across the world <clears throat> over and over again. But in essentially a bistable oscillator, okay? if you like those terms. Well, here's where we are today. If we have heroic global efforts to work together and vast investments in changing the energy system from fossil fuels to 
solar, renewables, wind, nuclear, et cetera. Um, there's a study by Shell that shows um, <clears throat> at, at levels that I don't think the, we're seeing anything like now an indication the world is going to work on that speed. But even if they did, it would get up to 550 parts per million. And there's a very detailed model by MIT of the global economy, the global energy system, that shows if we just continue at the rate we are now with the growth in <clears throat> uh, China and India and so forth, it will be up at 900 parts per million. Well, if you ask me what's going to happen, hard to say. It's a nonlinear system. All I can say is if you have something as complicated as the Earth system, and it's been real happy going back and forth like this for a million years, basically, you can trace this on back a couple of million years, we have now kicked it out of that equilibrium, and it will adapt, as any nonlinear dynamic system does, to something else. And that's what should worry you. Yeah? So how do they do the historical measurements of CO2 levels going back how long? Ice cores. So this, is the, this data is from the Antarctic ice core that goes down almost two miles. It's, it's the longest single ice core, and then they go in to each little segment of the ice core and they take out the bubbles and they get the isotopic abundance of carbon dioxide, of oxygen, and so forth. And that's how they're able to, the oxygen is the way they reconstruct the temperature. And then the carbon is how they figure out the CO2. How reliable are these measures? Well, there's many different groups that have looked at it. And, and I would say, you know, the width of these lines is basically the uncertainty in, in the measurements. So for those of you who would like uh, the latest scientific information, because there's many, many hundreds, if not thousands, uh, articles a year on climate, peer-reviewed articles being produced, <clears throat> and the IPCC was 2007, uh, just for Copenhagen, uh, at the end of the last year, uh, an eminent group of climate scientists, including our own Richard Somerville from uh, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCSD, put together the Copenhagen Diagnosis, which is a very readable account across all of the various uh, effects. I just took one to talk about to just set the scale. And furthermore, um, the California, um, actually, I can, Microsoft was trying to help. Um, the um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography has done very detailed analysis of the next 50 years in California and, and even in San Diego. And what you can see is the one, the, two of the major things is because it's an arid region, um, you're going to see a, a lot less water and you're going to see uh, a lot more wildfires. And for those of you who live here, that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so what does IT have to do with this? Well, I'm going to, rather than sort of be theoretical, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through examples. I'm going to anchor them with real scientific research that's underway. If you want to know more about it, you, the slides are sort of a guide to it. Um, but I'll start with the big picture from the 2020 report because that's the most authoritative thing that's out there, I think. Um, and then what we'll see is that there's a lot of energy, the generation of which in, say, most states, like take the Midwest, is 80% coal. So it's generating a lot of CO2, is wasted unnecessarily. That is, you can do exactly the same work with your computer with, as we'll see, up to 90% less energy. Um, and so how can we deal with that? how can we make the cellular infrastructure, which is so rapidly expanding right now, it's becoming a major part of this, more efficient. Then what can campuses do? Okay, because in my view, campuses are miniature cities. And since most of the world's population in the rest of the century will be in an urban setting, we are the laboratories for change. We are the places where we can look at the systemic changes in buildings and transportation and the way we live and the waste stream and so forth that can inform our society more generally about how we can more quickly respond to the cities. Your chancellor can actually get things to happen that the mayor can't uh, and, and, and so forth, although he would probably argue with that. Um, he's a good man. I really like him. 
Um, and then uh, data centers, which of course largely that's one thing we're seeing is this vast expansion of, of data centers, uh, and then applying IC2 to other sectors. So here's the report. Um, first, let's take their uh, uh, estimates of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the entire global ICT industry. Now there's two parts. You know the little gold wires that are on the chips and all that? So you gotta dig the gold out of the ground. And then you got the electro waste. What do you do with all this stuff? How do you recycle it and so forth? Then you got, you know, so there's this whole life cycle. That's what the dark green is. And then the light green is uh, just basically running the stuff. Uh, so the, for laptops it's the electricity, for uh, servers it's also the cooling. Uh, and what you can see is, by the way, that the assumptions that were built into this study is everything we know how to do today to make things more energy efficient, they've assumed have been done in the out years. So if we don't do a lot of the things that we know how to do now, those bars will be much longer. <laughs> and uh, even as it is, it is a 6% compounded annual growth rate in the amount of CO2 that's produced by our field. Um, put in perspective, 2% is roughly the amount of CO2 that's emitted by the global uh, air transportation system as it flies around, not including its life cycle, but just the emissions. So that's a lot. Well, what we're going to see is almost all the growth is actually in the developing countries, and so it's, it's not uh, something that we can just solve here in the U.S. by ourselves. Here's the same exact bars, but now what we've done is divided them up by which countries in the world are going to be generating that over, uh, you know, in 2002, 2007, and then looking into the future. Now, the U.S. and Canada is this end bar here. And so by 2020, the U.S. and Canada together will still account for only about 14 percent of the emissions globally. So this is why Obama sits down with the president of China, okay, because China is the battlefield. India, a little less so, because it's not nearly as intense right now. It's, it's coming behind, but it, because of the number of people in India, it will eventually become very important. So my point is that the only way that this is going to be solved is a global approach. And in fact, the actions to use more energy efficient techniques and, and, and less carbon emitting techniques in the rest of the country, is in the rest of the world, is going to be more, much more important than what we do to apply it in the U.S. However, many of the solutions may come from the U.S., okay? And so that this collaboration is, is quite uh, critical. Now, what's causing this in terms of, you know, is it, you know, is it my BlackBerry? Is it my Droid? Uh, is, it, is it my laptop? Is it the evil server complexes that Google and Microsoft have? Okay, well, so they, they go through all that, right? And so what you can see is that um, the, this is basically the internet, including the mobile infrastructure as well as all the routers and, um, uh, and so forth. The, the centerpiece is the data centers. And then this is PCs and, and laptops and printers. Now, when I first saw this, I said, no, that can't be right, right? I mean, Google's got a million servers. How can, well, it's M with them, it's M, million, M, right? And the number of laptops and PCs, that's B, that's the B word, right? Billion. And so that's the problem. Even though the laptops use less energy than, say, a server, if you've got a thousand times as many of them, right, it's going to end up with the long end of the, of the stick. So I find that pretty pretty fascinating that, that actually the, it's, we are the enemy. Our own use of these devices is the biggest part of the problem. And actually, if you look at the growth, notice that the data centers, while getting bigger from 2002 to 2020, it's a pretty small growth, really, if you look at it compared to the, the PCs and peripherals. That includes the printers and all that other stuff. Well, what could we do about that? And so this is where the computer scientists, uh, you know, roll up their sleeves and get at it. So Rajesh Gupta, who I believe talked here uh, three weeks ago, has made this little uh, USB widget 
that uh, goes into your laptop and in your laptop now you've got a bunch of radios you know you've got your Wi-Fi and you got your Bluetooth and you got your cellular um, uh, internet uh, you've got uh, fans you got disk drives you got processing units multiprocessor units and so what it goes is it goes through and monitors all of that and then it can go in and selectively uh, shut things down as not needed and, and here's what you see. In normal, you're using about 16 watts. Your batteries last about four hours. If you uh, put it, you know, like on uh, sleep altogether, then um, you, you last for a very long time if you like hibernate it. Okay? And then here it is running the same load as you're running here, but using this little widget. So, from my way of thinking about this, this means we are wasting, by essentially sloth, a vast amount of the energy that we're using to power these things. Well, what about PCs? And can, you know, it's fine. We're going to go around and stick one of these in every of the four billion laptops, you know? Well, so we've got to have a network solution. And so uh, a paper's just been accepted a few weeks ago that, uh, on what he calls sleep server. And here's an example of a PC. Now we're up to 100 watts. Um, you know, so it's a big desk side unit or something. Um, and, um, and again, with the uh, sleep server, you're down to 2 watts. Okay. So, uh, and the additional latency, in this case, is a little bit of wake up time, a few seconds or something like that. And that's enough to be noticeable, probably. But considering that you're working all day on a laptop, uh, when you consider the savings, uh, that's really quite something. And here is an example. This is just one of the PCs in our computer science building. We've now got this deployed all across this computer science building. And this was, you know, here's your 100 watts. Here, here it was. Here it's probably fired up the graphics processing unit or something. Um, and, and this is without the sleep server. And then here we turn it on, and down here is zero, right? So you can see that it's spiking up when it needs to, but otherwise it's, it's uh, saving enormous amount of energy. So given that this is the long end of the stick in terms of what's causing the carbon emissions, this kind of thing is, is, is really important. So at Cal IT2 now we're looking at taking our building and um, beginning to deploy these. What about the cellular infrastructure? Well, you know there are all these cell towers, and these cell towers have um, power amplifiers. Uh, and these things use a lot of, of energy. So what we did is we put together at Cal IT2 an uh, industrial consortium to look at whether we could make them much more energy efficient. The standard base station is about 10% efficient. And we currently have, have set a series of world records uh, uh, up to, uh, we're up to almost 60% now efficient from 10%. So again, I mean, we're just little university professor types, right? I mean, not some giant corporation that's out there. But this kind of innovation, in, in, in particularly public-private partnerships, show that in a short period of time, we could imagine not having to add a bunch of CO2 to the air to generate electricity we're wasting otherwise, right? Now, let's look at your campus as a whole. So let's go up from the individual PC and laptop to a campus full of them. You know, I was just at UC Davis two weeks ago, and their estimate is they have at least 50 clusters, what we call, in the closet, right? And we want them to get out of the closet, okay? And, and so what, what it is is, you know, the physics department, I'm sure, has one, Doug, and, and all these people, you know, have these poorly air conditioned, very inefficient, poor quality control on electricity, very poor security and so forth. But they're yours, right? And, and so that's the way it's sort of been developed. Well, there's a good reason that we don't like a centralized thing because we go over the shared internet and we get about 10 megabits a second. Well, a lot of our calculations generate a terabyte. How long does it take to move a terabyte over 10 megabit per second yeah, shared internet? answer 10 days okay so on the other hand over the fiber network that connects your office with the central if you've got a good fiber plant on your campus 
uh, you can each you can have a whole bunch of wavelengths on each fiber, and each of those can go at 10,000 megabits a second. In which case, it takes 10 minutes to move that same file. So at uh, we've gotten been fortunate to get a number of NSF grants at UC San Diego, and we've now built this new system in which you think of what I call the digital aquifer. So imagine under the this is sort of metaphorical, but imagine under the center of the quad, you have several petabytes of rotating storage, right? And that's everybody's storage. And, and, and then you've got 10 gigabits coming out from that back to your lab. Now imagine that you get a new gene sequencer. You got half a million dollars in your NIH grant. You went and got a next gener generation gene sequencer. Well, these things can produce about a terabyte of data in a run per day, okay? So what do you do with that? Well, you can go down to Fry's and, you know, buy yourself for under 100 bucks a terabyte disk drive, and then you can firewire a whole bunch of those together. No backup, no anything. And that's what a lot of people do, right? But wouldn't it make much more sense if in addition to the, the electrical plug on the wall and somewhere around here there's an ethernet for shared internet, there was an optical plug, and you just plug your machine in, flow the data off to the digital Data Oasis is what San Diego Supercomputer Center calls theirs. And, um, and then next to that are uh, large memory data analysis systems. So these things have RAM that's like right now a quarter to a half a terabyte. Uh, and with Gordon, an NSF funded project will be uh, several terabytes of RAM. Right? So imagine now you put all your data. See, RAM is about 100 times faster than disk. And so if right now people have these big data sets, and they're sitting on disk, and they bring them in very slowly, and then they crunch on them, and they only get a piece of the data. But now imagine you've got enough RAM. You just put all your data up there. Well, it's 100 times faster to start with. <laughs> and you have all of it. So you can do this all against all kind of thing. And so uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center has deployed a bunch of those. And, and, and that's right next to data analysis. And all these are 10 gigabit or multiple 10 gigabit, right? Um, there are some clusters that would make sense to still leave out there and, and, and bring in. On the other hand, there's a lot of the clusters that would go into what is called a condo. So uh, in the San Diego Supercomputer Center, there's just a whole lot of racks. And if you've got a PC, you, I mean, your, your cluster, you can just say, well, let me put it there. You have professional service and you have uh, this data pipe back to your lab, so how would you know that it wasn't there, right? Um, so uh, the digital library, the, uh, you know, once Google finishes digitizing a million volumes, what business are you in as a library anymore? Is it really housing all of those dead trees? Or is it managing vast amounts of data? And if that's the case, why isn't that your function for the whole campus, right? Because all of the disciplines, including the humanities and the arts, I'm going into the arts tomorrow morning to see digital art, okay? Is, uh, they all go from analog to digital, which is the transition we're living through. Then you can't support scholarly research on your campus without this kind of comprehensive digital cyber infrastructure. Yet, this is not something that's well understood. I can tell you as someone who spends their time, an itinerant preacher going around campus to campus, it's not, you know, the grok hasn't happened yet, okay? And, and so people do not yet think strategically that this is where they've got to go, but there's no other choice, I think. Okay, well, let's say we do that. So then you get into the business of, we got these machine rooms, right? And we, we're pulling all the stuff in it. But the trouble is, think about, we're air conditioning this room, right? Now, is the air causing any heat? No, you are each about, well, you're not quite a 100 watt light bulb, actually. You're, most of you look more like about 50. Um, <laughs> some are different than others. Yeah, some of you particularly are. Anyway, but, so it's like we had this whole room full of, of 50 watt light bulbs, and that's why we're air conditioning it. Well, wouldn't it be neat if we could just plastic wrap each of you with a little tube to the air conditioner? And, and then we could leave, we wouldn't have to spend all the energy and put the carbon in the air to, why are we cooling the rest of the air? <laughs> it's not doing anything wrong. 
So again, we're wasting a huge amount of energy, and that's wasting uh, putting carbon dioxide in the air we don't need to. So there's been a revolution in how you do data centers so that you're much more efficient. Um, and the extreme of this is to get what Sun has done and take an international uh, cargo container and use that as a, as a modular machine room that you put like eight racks in. We've got a couple of those. And, and so then we've got uh, sort of sensor nets through this whole thing. So we measure the temperature, we measure the energy input, all, you know, each one of these things at very uh, fine granularity. And then normally that's when the um, people who run the data center say, job's over. That's as efficient as we can get it. But the cool thing about bits is that you can apply software to them. Okay? And so it turns out that we have a whole bunch of different applications that are running on this. We have a whole bunch of different architectures. So we have your standard Intel multi-core. We have your NVIDIA graphics processing. We have your you know, field programmable gate arrays. We have um, different kind of storage devices, routers, and everything else. And, and so what we can look at is we've built a service-oriented ar architecture across this whole thing so that we can actually allow you to use different algorithms and match those to different architectures to perform exactly the same calculation, exactly the same answer, but with much less energy. And beforehand, if, since nobody was telling you how much energy <laughs> your particular instantiation of an algorithm of your application was using, you had no way of doing it. It's like, I cannot lose weight or exercise if I don't have biofeedback to see, you know, with a heart monitor and seeing exactly how many calories I'm burning and, you know, all of that stuff. It's the same thing here. So um, uh, this allows for using software to make a much more efficient use of it. Now, one of the problems with this is you get these much more tight machine rooms as you can't just open the door and walk in because you ruin the, the, the whole point to the exercise of having a nice ambient environment. So we just made a virtual reality uh, representation of this thing that is a real-time readout. And so we can bring up in the cave or on our hyperwalls uh, the uh, actual state of all of the devices, every one you rack in, in this thing, and uh, control the whole thing remotely. And, and particularly if you're looking to these larger ones, that's important. So there's all kinds of different uh, faculty now working. This was a uh, NSF uh, MRI grant, uh, major research instrumentation grant. Um, and I'll just show you one of them. So uh, Tiana Rosing, who I really hope you'll have up here, she's a real dynamite uh, researcher. Um, she's looked at both the dynamic power management and dynamic thermal management. And she's tying machine learning to this. So you have different loads come in. They do different things. You're observing all of that. And now you can have learning algorithms to decide what worked better and so forth. And you can tune things. And she ends up finding uh, energy savings up to 70% uh, in power management. Now, in thermal management, you can do the same thing. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you, the normal way you do this is <clears throat> you have a part of your calculation that then you put into, the, say, the graphics processor. Graphics processors, you know, generate a lot of heat. So then there's a thermos, you know, a, a thermometer, thermostat somewhere that, that is measuring the temperature of the box. And this thing radiates and radiates and radiates. And finally, it raises the temperature of the box. And at that time, it turns on the air conditioning. All right? Well, if you've done this enough and you have this machine learning, you know you're about to go into the GPU. So you turn up the air conditioning before you get to there. And of course, you don't generate all this extra heat that you then have to cool, right? So that gets you like 60%. OK, so that's a box. But that's not what the real world is. If you go to Google uh, or Microsoft or Amazon, they're talking about 100,000 processors. In, and, the, and the unit is one of these, actually quite a bit bigger than this box, that you know, gets dropped in, in. And so how across those mega systems can you be more energy efficient? And there is an engineering research center that uh, is, uh, we're a part of uh, at UCSD on uh, Center for Integrated Access Networks. 
and they got an MRI called SEED for Scalable Energy Efficient Data Center Project. And CalIT2 turns out to be where the test bed is. And so here's an example of one of these, each of these things here, if I blow it up, is uh, one of those racks except a lot bigger, maybe 20 racks or so. Um, and you know, this is how they do this. So the unit is no longer APC, right? The unit is one of these giant boxes. And so furthermore, they're all networked with each other. And the network speeds, when you begin to get the aggregate network, end up in the terabits per second very quickly. And so how do you uh, deal with that? Well, again, this is a little bit inside baseball for those of you who are into this sort of thing. But it turns out that when they, again, measure this stuff and, and, and go back and look at it, it turns out that like 90% of the data flows um, in terms of the total data is in about 10% of the flows. So um, you know how uh, over 50% of the bits on the internet today are in video. But there aren't that many videos compared to emails, right? But those are long, they're continuous, and they got a lot of cross-section and so forth. So it's the same thing in these data centers as you look across. Each of these is one of those boxes, right? And so what if you take an optical uh, switch that can handle the, you know, these flows that are sort of continuous flows and have a lot of the data, and the packet switching you use for the, you know, just all the clutter that goes around. And what you can show is this hybrid approach. You can get up to 3x in cost reduction, 6x less cabling, and maybe 9x reduction in power. So those are all ways in which we are cleaning up the act of the information technology itself. Now one of the main reasons we're doing that is to get the big return, we got to use a lot more IT and wireless sensors and so forth than we have now. Well, we can't do that to improve the energy efficiency of, say, our buildings, our smart electric grids, our transportation systems, and so forth, if we are using the current energy intensiveness of our ICT. You see what I'm saying? If you're going to use more of it to make our buildings smarter and less energy uh, intensive, we can't be adding as much energy to run the ICT as we're saving right, by having smart buildings. So, so over the next few years, we've got to see a radical drop in the energy cost. And, and you'll see this. If you have a Nexus One, for instance, from Google you'll, that runs a, it's an Android platform, it has a, Snap, a Qualcomm Snapdragon uh, processor, which is very energy efficient compared to, say, a normal PC processor. Because it has to be. It has to run all day long and you know, in a mobile environment. So, there is a whole new generation of this much more energy intensive stuff happening. But the cool thing is what the 2020 report shows out is that, is that if, we had, if, we, if we sort of extended the internet throughout the physical world, into our cars, into our buildings, into our logistics change and everything else, we could save five times the amount of carbon emissions from the ICT global that we have today and that can be done in a fairly short time, which is what's important, right? So uh, again, this is a bit of an eye test, but this is uh, an example of all the various areas from the smart electric grid uh, to smart buildings to here's dematerialization, that's like teleconferencing, for instance, or using a Kindle instead of a book, um, and how much in terms of gigatons of CO2 emission a year globally would be saved uh, with this smart approach. So I'm just going to take three of these um, and look at them in a little more uh, detail. Sorry, what, what fraction of greenhouse gas emissions would you need? So the total um, from ICT, which is about 2% of the global total, is 1.4. And this represents 7.8. So that would be 10% uh, of the global greenhouse emissions, which is comparable to the amount we're talking about reducing by 2020 under these treaties that, are, that Copenhagen, for instance, was not successful in uh, creating. So I, I wrote an article, and I'll have uh, some references at the end of the lecture, on, um, with some colleagues on 
thinking about, well, why don't we use our own campuses as test beds for this? And, um, and, and so UC San Diego, UC Irvine are way along on this. Uh, they have their own generation electricity. Um, uh, we import only less than 10% of electricity on UCSD campus uh, from the grid. The rest we generate ourselves. Um, we have our own transportation fleet. Over 50% of the UCSD transportation fleet is already on alternative energies. Um, we have the ability to do travel substitution by using teleconferences, and I'll show you that. So I'm not going to have time to go through all this, but I'll just look at two of these things, looking at the how to make our buildings uh, more energy efficient and um, how we can substitute bits for atoms and moving people around. If you, how yeah. Generating your local power? It's, uh, it's a, a natural gas uh, regen uh, plant. So it has some carbon emission, but it's about as clean as carbon fuels go. And for those of you, uh, UCI, for instance, uh, won the best overall in the state. And there's this contest that the power companies put on on Flex Your Power. And there's a reference to that. Uh, there's a great student video that was produced by the students themselves on all the green activities going on at UC San Diego. Uh, so this is the. Um, article, and by the way, it's on the web. You can go directly to that and read it. So for instance, in Cal IT2, just like CNSI here is in UCLA and Santa Barbara, we're in UC San Diego and UC Irvine. And although I've made probably 100 day trips up there in 10 years, uh, multiple times a week, we use uh, high definition video conferencing. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't added up what that saved in terms of carbon emission of, of, of driving up there, but it's a lot. Um, I have worked a lot with Australia, and uh, as a result, um, one of the things they want me to do is give talks there. So we've built a system over these fiber optics where I can just go down to the first floor of my building. We've had a high definition studio, and I just give the broadcast from there. I mean the and it's not just a broadcast, it's interactive. So this is taken from uh, Monash University at, in Melbourne. And the students ask me questions. They see the PowerPoints. And, and because it's high definition, it's actually just about as good as being there. In fact, I'm going to give a talk in um, a few weeks. Now, um, the NSF funded this project called the Optiputer that I was principal investigator of. It involved a lot of university partners, a lot of industry partners. And the question was, OK, say you go to the end of the rainbow, you drink the Kool-Aid, you believe we're going to live in these 10 gigabit flows. How do you re-engineer everything? So think about this. This guy, this PC, this laptop, OK, has been system engineered to be impedance matched to the shared fixed internet. Okay? My droid, which I really love, OK? So my droid is system integrated to, this is Twitter, um, to the wireless properties, right? So what is the, this is the termination device for the wireless internet. <clears throat> this is the appropriate amount of compute power, storage, I.O., everything for the wired internet. What is it for 10,000 megabits a second, clear channel? <clears throat> and, and, and it's these, uh, fortunately, everybody already was using Linux clusters, so they just forgot to buy the LCDs. And so we found a way to actually put the LCDs together, make a windowing system that goes over all this. And so you can see this young scientist here um, looking at HELOC cancer cells that have been, um, uh, it's a collage of uh, confocal light microscope images of three different stains. And there's a 600 million pixel image here that this is a high uh, blow up of. This is a remote high definition uh, colleague coming in. This is the room about 100 feet away where the microscopes are. These are the four real time feeds coming out of the microscope. Um, and so this is the world that we've created to live in. Now, that changes the way you do business. So for instance, this is the way we have meetings between UC Irvine and UC San Diego, is we just glue the rooms together with high definition video. 
There's also a lot of work on the sound, by the way. The sound is actually a lot harder to do well than the video. Uh, so this is me, right? This is San Diego. That's Irvine. And I turn around and ask, see people with their hands up, and I you know, ask them. They, they talk. Everybody here sees them. They're, there's like microphones that go around that uh, people talk with. Well, what we're going to do eventually, we're right now putting out microphone arrays where we can use digital signal processing in real time to actually identify where the voice is. So eventually we will not have to have handheld microphones. So what we do basically is I'm mic'd and one or two of the people who are going to make comments are mic'd and then we have just Oprah handheld mics to go around. And it works pretty well actually. And then with NASA Ames, uh, they came down and wanted to do this because there are two of these institutes that NASA has, the Lunar Science Institute and the Astrobiology Institute, that are explicitly created as virtual institutes. That means we're most investigators out in universities, hundreds of investigators out in universities, and there's just this core facility sitting at NASA Ames. And so they came down like this, and so here we are. This is a 300 million pixel wall, so this is, each of these is four megapixel, 30 inch screens. Um, this is the, what you're seeing is the HD video of Larry Edwards at Mountain View uh, in front of his wall at the Lunar Science Institute. And he's interacting with Kai Dorr, who's the guy who developed the software that allows for all of this to happen. As, just, in fact, for those of you, how many have an iPad or have seen somebody use an iPad? Okay, well what you'll find when you would see an iPad is that it's stunning because it, the fluidity at which you can move things around is like, unbelievable. Well, it is faster on the 300 million pixel wall than it is an iPad. Okay? And that's because we have like 18 of these Dell 2 NVIDIA card per box and 10 gigabit uh, networking. And we've extended this internationally and driven by the digital arts. So one of the things that we do is four times high definition resolution. It's what's called 4K digital cinema. And we had the first 4K digital cinema projector in the US at Cal IT2 about five years ago. So we've worked internationally a lot on this. And this is an example. This is taken in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Sheldon Brown, who's the head of the Center for Research and Computing in the Arts, Circa, um, uh, has been working with them. This is the director of a new feature link uh, film that was shot entirely in 4K and edited in 4K. And the premiere of this film uh, was the first tri-continent premiere over streaming 4K uh, in history. Uh, and what you see here is that's the director. Uh, this, this is a 4K screen, which you can divide into four HD screens uh, under software control. So this is our division director at, UC, at Cal IT2 at UCSD. Uh, this is the uh, KO Japan, which has got the lead for digital cinema in Japan. That's the director sitting in Sao Paulo, and that's the audience in Sao Paulo. And so they both, this is the next morning where they're having a discussion of having seen the film that was streamed the night before. So this is the kind of, of replacing travel that uh, is getting um, better and better. And, and it's, again, not just like the Cisco telepresence, which is probably about the state of the art for looking at you know, meetings across the table. This is sewing whole rooms together you know, so that, so that effectively, it, you know, it, this is how collaboration will effectively get done in the 21st century as this develops because, of course, this just continues to exponentiate down in Prost and, and, and more and more people get to do it. Okay, let's finish. Let's go to buildings now. And uh, so one of the things UCSD has done is actually instrument all the buildings and then there's a web interface to them so you can see the real-time uh, uh, usage in the buildings. Here are a number of buildings over uh, several weeks. Uh, each of these is a spikes is a day. Up here is, uh, this is uh, the Cal IT2. This is the uh, uh, computer science building and this is sort of like a normal dorm or something down here. So my electricity bill for the building at UCSD is a million dollars a year. So it would be worth lowering that. So we instrumented the CSE building, and this is Rajesh Gupta, and what we found is here's the peak load from the air conditioners turning on at 6 in the morning. This is about 50%. This is the base load. It never goes below this. This is about 50% of peak. And that base load is um, about 70% of that is PCs and servers. 
and about 90% of that can be eliminated. So you're talking real money. You know, you could hire postdocs, you could, you know, <laughs> et cetera. And um, you can break it out into what the lighting is and what, you know, everything else. I won't take you through this. But I mean, the idea is that you can now instrument this um, because so much of it is IT, you make the building much more energy intensive uh, by doing that uh, with this duty cycling. Now, buildings in the United States account for 40% of the carbon uh, dioxide emission of the greenhouse gas emission of the country across everything, right? So that's why it's a worthwhile target. And uh, so finally, how do we, you know, I mean, this is all great, but how do we get the word out? So one of the things is that there's being more and more conferences that are being held between like the regulatory body, like the California Public uh, Utility Commission, the academic researchers, uh, the people like you're going to have at your uh, summit uh, from Google and Hewlett Packard and all those kind of people. And those are kind of summits that we've been having. Uh, and it's been global. There's a center for this in Melbourne that's doing the same thing. Because until we have these discussions and get our minds around what is causing the problem, where the levers are for making things better, all you have instead is politics. And this is not helping. Okay? What we need is engineering to actually get the job done. Um, for those of you, I'll just quit here with, with a few references that, uh, that I'll just leave here. This is uh, 10 or 12 articles on the Optiputer system. Um, these are articles that have come on the smart building and the PC efficient uh, group. This is the data center articles. Uh, and then all of my talks, videos, everything else are on my um, on my web, uh, my live streaming portal that you can go to, uh, including my all my tweets. So here I had dinner last night with John Bowers and Fred <laughs> Chong. Uh, I, I this is the whole issue of how you use social networks to actually get the word out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>